The Retirement Cafe Podcast, episode 89, Why Understanding Mental Capacity is Critical with Professor Keith Brown. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe Podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. He is your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is sponsored by My Financial Planner. Not knowing when you can afford to retire or what your pensions will provide can be worrying. My Financial Planner provides independent fixed fee retirement planning advice, bringing clarity to your financial future. At My Financial Planner, we build a financial plan for your retirement and equip you with the knowledge to implement the plan. And if you want to, select any products yourself rather than being sold any pensions or investments. Find out more about putting a plan to fund the retirement that you really want at myfinancialplanner.co.uk. I was honoured to chat recently with government advisor and renowned expert in mental capacity and adult care and safeguarding, Professor Keith Brown. Professor Brown has spent a lifetime in the medical profession. Starting his career in paediatrics 35 years ago, he leads the National Centre for Post-Qualifying Social Work and Professional Practice. He also sits on a number of government advisory boards and has been called upon extensively to provide guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic. He sits on the Department of Health Adult Safeguarding Advisory Board, the Joint Department of Health and Ministry of Justice, National Mental Capacity, uh, Leadership Forum, the Home Office Joint Financial Task Force. In the first of two interviews, we chat about mental capacity, the role of the next kin and lasting powers of attorney, and how to ensure your wishes are followed in the event of tragedy at any stage of life. I really do hope you enjoy my conversation with Professor Keith Brown. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Keith Brown. Hello there. How are you doing today? Nice to meet you. (laughs) Thanks for taking the time to come and have a chat today. Um, uh, Well, for the listeners who don't know you, Professor, can you tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, of course. So so my name is Professor Keith Brown, or Keith Brown, just call me Keith. Um, And I run the National Centre for Post-Qualifying Social Work, which is one of those titles that's got far too many words in it and no one knows what the heck it means. Um, in sort of simplish English, uh, every subject group in, in academia has a national centre. So there's a national centre for oceanography, a national centre for physics, and I run the national centre for social work. And that basically means uh, I do, in my department, runs high-level, complex educational training programmes and does a lot of national research and advises government in complex sort of welfare type issues. Uh, and in particular, we specialise in mental health uh, and mental capacity, older persons care and safeguarding. So that's the kind of the day job. And wow. I've been doing that for 20 years. Well, wow. I mean, at the moment, this is a big topic. <laughs> I yeah. mean, there's not, there's not much bigger, I don't think. <laughs> um you know. I, I, I think, you know, recently in COVID has really made us realise that how we care for older citizens and, and the care, the way we care is really top of the agenda. Um, ironically, we're quite a small team. We you know we are the National Centre working in this field. If I was specialising in childcare, there'd be 10 teams like me in the country. Wow. But we're quite small, and it just reflects the fact that actually, as a society, we've not spent very long thinking about how the state, how the welfare state, joins up care of older people. And uh, as many of your listeners will know, often when the sort of push comes to shove, people fall through gaps and there are problems, whether it's residential care, hospital care, end of life care. There are some quite serious issues that we need to face as society. Yeah. Yeah, and you're you're based at Bournemouth University, is that right? Yeah, I came down to the South Coast uh, 25 years ago, back to the South Coast, actually. Um, I started off in paediatrics. I, I used to run the uh, paediatric intensive care unit in in London, in St. George's. Wow. But uh, sort of 35 years ago, uh, came to Southampton and uh, did some postgraduate work here, 
spent a bit more time in Essex and London, but um, in 1994, I decided to come into academia and uh, sort of ended up in Bournemouth. There are, there are two national centres at the university, National Centre for Computer Animation and mine. And my mother always used to say to me, it's better to be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond. <laughs> and uh, Bournemouth University has actually searched me very well because I'm allowed to do what I like. Great, great. So tell me, tell me what you're working on currently. So a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment is around a subject called mental capacity. Now, mental capacity, what does that mean? Well, a better way of looking at it is we talk a lot about dementia. We talk about people um, suffering with dementia. And, and dementia is a really classic case when technically someone's losing what we would call cognitive, they've got cognitive impairment. They're losing the ability to make complicated decisions. And the technical term now we use is capacity. Does somebody have the capacity, the mental faculty, to understand what's going on and to make decisions about themselves? And often it's in terms of and to give consent. So that might be to give consent for treatment. So are they able to say, I understand what you're about to do to me and I'm happy for you to do that? For people like you, Justin, it might be, has the person got the capacity to understand the complex nature of a financial transaction they might be about to make yeah. and uh, can they sign for a pension policy or a complicated uh, financial product or not and really this has come to fore with covid because people that uh, suddenly get covid they might end up in hospital they might end up on a ventilator they might end up unconscious on a ventilator and therefore they don't have the capacity to make decisions about what's going to happen to them. Do they want to be kept alive? Do they even want to go onto a ventilator? What are their, what we would call technically, what are their advanced care planning decisions? And most people in society put off talking about those things. We almost like don't talk, we, we didn't used to talk about cancer. It was the C word. We do talk about cancer now because fortunately, you know, over 50% of people that get cancer survive at least five years. It's not death automatically. No. But we still as society don't like talking about what would we like to have happen to us should tragic events happen. And of course, what we've seen in the last few months is in particular some pretty difficult decisions to be met, being made and some actually illegal decisions being made about the way people in care homes are cared for. Yeah. So you saw around Easter a number of doctors and GPs doing what's called blanket do not resuscitate notices or blanket do not uh, do pulmonary, pulmonary resuscitation, CPR. Absolutely illegal. You cannot do that. You cannot make those decisions for people without their consent or without involving them. And so I was pretty rapidly in the early days of... Um, the COVID response, writing new uh, guidance for the NHS on advanced care planning and really to remind the NHS and the social care system of the Mental Capacity Act and the Human Rights Act and what you can and can't do. And out of that is one of the, the, the brochures you've got now available. Take it down from my website if you like. The sort of uh, guidance on advanced care planning and advise anybody, anyone listening to this, have a conversation with your loved ones about what do you want to have happen to you should a difficult situation happen. Yeah. And it might be right that uh, your loved one stays in a care home and ends up their time in a care home and, and doesn't go to hospital and go into high tech. But let that be your decision rather than somebody else making that decision on your behalf. And of course, it's not just a conversation, is it? We need to actually formalise this. Absolutely right. And you know, one of the great difficulties is that people assume that the next of kin can help out and the next of kin can speak on their behalf. So your husband or your wife, your mum, your dad, your son, your daughter, as the next of kin, in somehow they've got the legal authority to speak on your behalf. And, you know, the, the truth is the term next of kin does not exist in law apart from the 1834 Interstate Act, which means if you die without a will, then the term next of kin is there. Right. But in terms of 
next of kin to advocate on someone's behalf. That doesn't exist in law. And the Mental Capacity Act, ironically enough, was, was part of it, was to overcome that problem and it introduced something called the lasting powers of attorney. And, and lasting powers of attorney are there so that today you and I can say, who would we want to act on our behalf if we lost capacity or we weren't able to consent for ourselves? And there are two sorts of lasting powers of attorney, property and affairs and health and welfare. And it worries me that there are more than twice as many property and affairs LPAs written and registered than there are health and welfare property, uh, lasting powers of attorney. And to put it bluntly, if anything happened to me, I'm more interested in how I'll be cared for than who's going to spend my money. Yeah. But as human beings, we seem to worry more about who's going to spend my money than how I'm going to be cared for. And I'd say to everyone listening to this, if you do nothing else, consider getting a lasting power of attorney in health and welfare for every single member of your family, 18 and older. This is not just about older people. No. You know, if you're a mum or a dad of a 19-year-old going to university, you still see yourself as a mum and dad. But what we do know is that youngsters sometimes do silly things. They go to parties. They take the drug they shouldn't have taken. They drive a motorbike too quickly. You know, you can have a head injury. You can have a stroke. You can have brain trauma brought on by a drug overdose. Well, can you imagine how you'd feel if your youngster was in a hospital bed or unconscious on life support and someone said to you, well, you might be the mum and dad, but you've got no power of attorney and therefore you've got no right because the next of kin doesn't exist here. So get an LPA in for that child of yours that's going to university or wherever they're going and, and make sure that there's some legal framework in place. So for younger people, for older people, for middle-aged people, indeed, for all of us, when you turn 18, I almost think it should be statutory, your 18th birthday, you register an LPA so that someone's there to act on your behalf should there ever be a tragic event in your life. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I've impressed that on all of my clients and it's not just for them, it's uh, also for their children and grandchildren. But, you know, it, it, it doesn't sound very necessary, does it? And if coming back to the property versus the, the um, health and welfare, and of course they are both, both important, but one of the questions that I always ask people, I say, you know, you, 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 would you like, and I could ask you, Keith, you know, money, money or health, you, you have a choice. Which one do you want? Which one do you want? Yeah. And you I, want health every time, don't you? Health every time, and therefore, you know, this is this is all comes down to. Um, someone said to me that we spend um, we spend all our lives uh, trying to get wealthy, um, and and then we spend all our money trying to get healthy. Um. <laughs> yeah, see, right? Yeah, and only about one million LPAs, health and welfare, registered in the UK. One million only. Wow, that's a lot of people that aren't protected. It is huge amount. Now, do you think that um, uh, it's not going to happen to me, or do you think it's the monetary cost because it's it does you know it's, it's not ex exceptionally cheap? Um, the, the, if you go to solicitors, uh, there's obviously an additional cost. Um, I often, if people are doing something quite simple, I know that um, obviously you can go online with the OPG and you can do it directly yourself, or even if you get slightly confused by that. Um, the Consumers Association, which have a quite a good service, which uh, they'll check your LPA before submitting it. Um, they've got a deal on, I think, at the moment. It's about seventy-nine pounds plus, of course, the, the costs to the OPG. Um, but there, you know, there are, there are. Is it? Do you think it's because it's complex? Because I've got to go and see a lawyer. Um, uh, I'll get round to it one day. What's the what's the maybe the nub yeah. that we need to give people? There is a cost, although I'd just like to remind all listeners that. Um, if you're on state benefits, if you're on universal credit, if you're on, if you're, you're really hard up, it's actually free. So for anybody on some state support, apart from a state pension, um, uh, registering the lasting power of attorney is free. It's paid for by the state. For the rest of us, uh, it's about eight to two pounds to register an LPA, and you can, as you say, do it online. I think most of us just don't want to think about the future. Yeah. And therefore, and I know some people are actually so afraid of doing it because they think if I write one, the following day something tragically will happen to us. It's almost like playing the lottery. We don't want to play roulette. 
it's just madness. You know, we, we put a seatbelt on when we go in a car just in case, but we don't think about LPAs just in case. It is, it is as crazy as that. Yeah. This is a very personal view, and, and I wouldn't want to be overly recorded on this, but I'm going to give it out now when it is going to be recorded. Um, I think sometimes it is worthwhile paying a solicitor to write your LPA. There are two reasons. One, you can be certain that it's done correctly and registered correctly, and if not, they're in trouble. Absolutely. But two, and I'm not doing this, I'm not saying this to, to generate business for solicitors, in my experience, if a hospital or a doctor sees an LPA with a solicitor's letter attached to it, they listen far more than if they see one that you've done yourself. Mm, interesting. And um, part of the whole process of the Mental Capacity Act is something called best interest decisions. I think one of the difficulties we've got is that historically, and I think, you know, I, I want to be say, you know, most doctors and most healthcare professionals are not like this, but historically, some people in the medical profession have had a kind of a sense of we are the professionals and we know best and we will act in your best interest. Is that actually your best interest or is that the most expedient? And just on the South Coast, you know, it's not that many years ago and we had the whole Gospel War Memorial Hospital tragedy where, you know, it looks like up to a thousand people were potentially had their lives shortened and their end of life hastened with overdosing of uh, opiates and morphine. Clearly, we're still waiting for the police prosecution potential on that. But I just can't say enough. It's really important that you you have an LPA health and welfare that very clearly and very and legally says who is there to speak on your behalf. Yeah. And make sure that everybody knows about it, your GP, your medical people, your doctors, so that the person that you want to speak on your behalf is ready to do so. And as I say, sometimes just having a solicitor's letter appended to that just makes things a little bit more uh, expedited and happen more smoothly. And that's just a personal view. Um, but, it, you know, whenever I'm speaking to friends, that's the advice I give. Absolutely. And I um, I recollect you mentioning to me um, before um, when we were talking offline about uh, the story about PC Paul Briggs. Yeah. Could you um, Could you reflect on that for me? Yeah, of course. So this is now just over three years ago now, but a gentleman called PC Paul Briggs was was knocked off his motorbike on the way to work. It wasn't a police motorbike. It was his own mode of transport. And unfortunately for him, Paul, he ended up in hospital on a life support machine. His wife and his young child, he had a, a baby daughter, his wife made the decision that she wanted life support to be switched off. But unfortunately... She thought as the next of kin, she would have the right to say that. But she didn't have the right to say that. And we don't switch off life support machines in those situations unless we're absolutely convinced through the court of protection that there's no chance of a person recovering from that situation. And so she went to the court of protection. She asked for the right for life support to be switched off. And it took her almost a year to go through that process and the amount of pain and grief that she went through. And at the end of that process, when the decision was made in her favour, actually, that life support could be switched off, I did a number of radio interviews. And everybody on the radio kept saying, why could she not insist? Why could she, as his wife, not say, look, stop this, stop caring for him, switch off life support? Mm. And the simple answer is, because she's not the next of kin in legal terms, even though she was his wife. There was no lasting power of attorney. Now, actually, I think that's crazy. Why is it that every police officer in the land is not automatically as part of their job? You know, you you sign on, you start, and you fill in your LPA because it's a difficult and dangerous task. And, you know, in the last few years, we've seen, unfortunately, many policemen facing some pretty difficult situations with terrorism, with bombs, all these sorts of things. It should be almost a condition of service. Yeah. What was really frustrating for me is that um, I was in a number of government departments following this case saying we need to do something about this. We need to write some national guidance on the importance of lasting powers of attorney and uh, 
and, and the issues about next of kin. And honestly, all I got was, we're too busy with Brexit. We're too busy with Brexit. We're too busy with Brexit. So in the end, out of a fit of peak, I said, right, well, I'll do it. And so I wrote the national guidance on next of kin and lasting power of attorney. And again, you can download that from my website, if you like. And uh, there it is. And uh, that's the national guidance on, on, uh, on lasting powers of attorney and next of kin. Of course, the following year, we had another di really difficult situation because another thing you can do is, is lodge something called an advanced decision to refuse treatment. So you can say, if anything happens to me, I don't want to be resuscitated. Or if anything happens to me, don't keep me alive on a, li a life support machine for a long time. You can make your own decisions about how you want to be cared for in those moments. And just a couple of years ago, a lady was, was unfortunately unconscious, kept alive on a life support machine, even though the hospital had an advanced decision to refuse treatment from her, saying, do not put me on a life support machine. But the hospital lost the ADRT, and she was kept alive on a, on a ventilator for 10 months. And eventually, the GP realized what was going on and knew that she had an ADRT and raised it with the hospital. And they realized that they'd illegally, because this is a legal document, kept her alive against her wishes for 10 months on the life support machine. So the hospital ended up switching off the life support machine to honor her wishes, made an out of court settlement to the family for all the distress. We, the taxpayer, pick up the bill for 10 months intensive care on a, on a ventilator care and we haven't actually honored the person's wishes because she is an elderly person did not want to be kept alive anyway sure so again in a fit of peak i wrote the, the, the national guidance on adrts and that's also available on the website so together it gives you a picture of thinking about your next of kin thinking about lasting powers of attorney and thinking about do you want to make an advanced decision to refuse types of treatment you don't have to, but if you are in a position where you don't want to be resuscitated or kept alive or put on a ventilator or anything like that, you have the legal right to say exactly what you want to have happen to you. And I think, um, I mean, I, I don't know this, but I can only imagine that from a medical perspective, that these documents are really kind of empowering. Uh, you know, hold on, the, the responsibility suddenly is not all with me. Exactly. If they're done well, they're really, and that's why we call it part of the advanced care planning process, it's really helpful to the doctor or the nurse or the healthcare professional because you're clear what the wishes of that person are and you can, in a good, in a real positive sense, give the best possible care. You're not second guessing. You're not thinking, what would the person want? It's clear what the person wants and you can actually provide the care and the care package around that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Keith, it's been really fascinating talking to you today. And what I'm going to do in the show notes and on the website, we're going to put all the links to all those documents that you've brilliantly created um, and, and details you know, uh, about you. Where can people find out more about you and the work that you do? The simplest way is to just look on our website. It's a funny that title, ncpqsw.com. That's the National Centre for Post-Qualifying Social Work.com. Otherwise, to be honest with you, if you Google Professor Keith Brown, a pop up and you can find me quite easily, track me down, have a look at stuff. And it's all there. Well, that's fantastic. Um, uh, I really look forward to talking to you again. I know there's plenty more to talk to you about. Um, so uh, thank you for the time this afternoon, Keith. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. A huge thank you to Professor Keith Brown for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to share his knowledge with us. To find out more about Keith's work uh, and uh, what he gets up to, check out the show notes on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk, where you'll also find some useful links, including the links to the guidance booklets Keith mentioned on Next of Kin and Lasting Powers of Attorney. As ever, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review on iTunes and be sure to subscribe either on our website or your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. You'll find out first where my second conversation with Keith about adult safeguarding and financial scams will be released. Thank you also to my financial planner, the Fixed Fee Retirement Planning Specialist, for sponsoring the podcast. You can find out more about how they can help you bring clarity to your retirement at myfinancialplanner.co.uk. 
So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk. 